Hello and welcome to What's Your Question. Today's question is, why is it important for us to think about the quality of evidence in a claim and the quality of the sources that someone uses when they make a specific claim? We're going to talk about why this is important, we're going to talk about how we can find the best type of source and we're going to talk about um, what kind of evidence is the best as well when you're making a claim of some description. Let's go, 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 go! To begin with then, I've placed a question here. I would like you to spend two minutes trying to write down the names of as many different parts of the scientific method as you can. Anytime anyone does a scientific investigation, they always follow the same steps. I'd like you to have a think about what those steps are and list them down on a piece of paper for me, please. If you think you know what all those steps are, can you pause the video here and write down anything that you know about the steps in a scientific investigation then please go right okay so the different steps to a scientific investigation are number one you must start with a question of some kind that you're going to answer when it comes to that question your first step is to make a hypothesis about what you think the answer is i think this is the answer you're then going to need to come up with some kind of practical that you're going to do to find out the answer to this question or some kind of investigation you're going to do to find the answer to this question. Once you've decided on your experiment, you're going to need to make a prediction about what's going to happen in that experiment. Once you've done those two things, you can start to write out the plan for what it is your experiment's going to entail. Your first job will be to write a list of the equipment you're going to use. That would need to be everything you're going to use in that experiment. It also includes you writing down how you're going to use each thing as well and potentially drawing a diagram to show you what that equipment's going to look like as well once it's set up. Once you have the equipment list, you're then going to write a method step by step explaining exactly how you're going to do uh, the investigation that you're planning out. Being specific about what equipment you will use, when, how you'll make any measurements and the different things you'll be doing in that experiment should be as simple and easy to follow as possible to make your experiment repeatable. Once you've written a method, the next step is to design a results table to put your results into, obviously. Uh, once you have a results table, you then go on to write a risk assessment to make sure that your experiment is not too dangerous for you to do. Uh, and if it was too dangerous in any way, you do everything you could to um, reduce those risks and make it so you are more able to do the experiment safely. Uh, once you have got a results table and the risks are all planned out and you have a method, you'd collect your results into that results table. Once they're in the results table, you would then um, draw a graph to represent those results so you can analyse the data. Once the data has been analysed, you would draw a conclusion, uh, which is you saying, I think this is going to happen, or I think these are, we found this in our experiment, um, as this increased, that increased. Uh, just going back to your data, justifying any points that you've made, always using that data, uh, and also talking about any anomalous results and the reasons for those. The final few steps are then to evaluate your experiment, say what you did well and why, and what you could improve. And finishing off, you'd then go on to talk about what could be done by somebody else who was looking at this information. Uh, future research is what we generally refer to that as. Great, let's move on to the rest of the lesson then. We'll start off with this. Your objectives in today's lesson then are going to be the following two things that I've placed over here. You're going to first of all be to describe what we mean by a peer review uh, and why we go through the peer review process. Uh, we're also going to be able to you're also going to be able to describe and talk about how we can assess the source of some evidence because the evidence generally comes from various places and you need to be able to know what's a good source and what's a poor source uh, of information. First of all then, we need to talk about what we mean by a peer review. You may not have heard of them before, but in science, any research we do that, that we uh, think is useful is generally published in what we call a journal. Here's a few examples of different journals you may come across. Uh, these journals will publish on a regular basis all the articles that have been submitted to them that they have approved. Uh, the peer review process is really, really important. It involves other scientists reading through the work of other people, testing that work again to make sure it's repeatable and make sure it can be done again and people find the same results. This means that by publishing this data, it's being shared with other people, meaning that like, five different people don't end, up, don't end up doing the same research. It means that people um, know the research being published is of good quality because it's been checked by a number of different people and they've all found the same thing. And it means that if you're trying to find out something, um, then you know 
that we can go and look at these specific places. There'll be journals for a specific thing that you're talking about, like journals of psychology, journals of biology, and journals of various other things as well. Uh, lots of different areas of science have got their own specific journal. Any work that doesn't go through the peer review process and is then referred to by anyone is not particularly good as evidence because it's not been checked by the people. It's not been looked over to make sure that it's, a, um, it's, it's correct. Uh, and this means that people can say basically anything they want if their research isn't being checked by other people. Uh, and that means that we're open to false information and fake news, which you may have heard of being mentioned quite a lot recently. When it comes to evidence, there, or not all evidence has the same weight to it. Not all evidence is as good evidence as all other evidence. Some is better than others. The reason why this is, is because of where it comes from. There's two main types of evidence that you may come across. We have what's called anecdotal evidence. You may know that an anecdote is a story from somebody. So if I told you that I didn't think that smoking caused cancer because my granddad smoked for 60 years and he never got it, my evidence isn't particularly strong. This is because only one person has got this, has got this result uh, and that's not a particularly important or relevant piece of information. Uh, if I'm going to make broad statements about the effectiveness of someone, I need to know in large numbers how effective it is. And me referring to just about my granddad isn't particularly trustworthy. It's the same reason why a lot of people don't believe when it comes to ghosts and aliens, because we don't have any repeatability to that evidence or any testability to it. The same is true for people who are, who are uh, claim they can talk to the dead. Um, you can always talk to them about what people say has happened to them. You can talk about what they say they might have seen in terms of a ghost, but when it comes to testing it, we have no good evidence to back up the claims that they're making. So this anecdotal evidence is not particularly great. When it comes to scientific evidence, this is evidence that's been through the peer review process. Scientific evidence generally is better for any claims that you're trying to make because it includes any of a number of different things behind it. It's got that repeatability to it. Someone has double checked and triple checked this information to make sure that it is correct. They'll generally have collected more data than just one person. You could also go and test this stuff and generally, most of the time, you would find these things to be correct. These things would generally also be published into those journals we talked about before, which is how we know how important and truthful those things are going to end up being. So when it comes to evidence, we don't like anecdotal evidence. We do like scientific evidence. Stories from individuals, not great. Data from large groups is significantly better. We also need to consider some things about this data because although scientific evidence is great, there are several things which can affect how good its quality is. The first of these things is who's funding this research. Generally, it will be funded by the government, specific companies or non-profit organisations. The government currently is doing a lot of uh, research into the COVID-19 um, disease that we know about currently, or coronavirus, uh, as it's called, if you're talking about the virus itself. Um, we're doing a lot of research into that. That research, because the government generally wants to find a cure for this, it's going to be of good quality because they're trying to make it so it's effective. When it comes to companies, unfortunately, companies have agendas. They want their product to be better. This means there can be specific problems with them doing research into something they're trying to sell. Uh, if you ever watch adverts for things like shampoo, any claims they're making those are generally followed at the bottom of the screen by a small sentence telling you, this might not be quite so true because we have got this, these very small terms and conditions for you to read at the bottom. Um, we call, uh, oh, the final one, sorry, is non-profit organisations, things like the British Heart Foundation, charities who are trying to collect money, uh, the Alzheimer's uh, uh, charities. There's basically charities for most diseases that you know about these days, cancers and things like those. And their research is unlikely to be particularly poor because they are trying deliberately to cure those things. They're non-profit, no one's making any money from these things. They're just trying to find a cure to help people. When it comes to companies with an agenda or sometimes governments, which can also have agendas too, we talk about bias in their research. Bias just means that they are drawn towards making positive conclusions for certain things or drawn towards specific conclusions for some things. For example, example, a uh, 
uh, shampoo company may be drawn to say that their shampoo does better than other shampoos does. Um, when it comes to specific drugs they're trying to sell, it may be drawn to say that our drug treats that illness better than those drugs. So we have to consider that bias when we're looking at the quality of our evidence. This means that when you're critiquing a claim, you need to be looking at where that evidence has come from so you can talk about how good quality it is. What are the steps then in assessing the quality of evidence? There's a several steps you need to always follow. The first one is to look at the authors of whatever evidence you're looking at. Who wrote it? Are they the right people to do this research or are they from the right field? Um, you wouldn't look at information on biology from a physicist's standpoint. You want a person who's qualified in that field uh, to be able to look at exactly what it is they are doing. Where has it been published? Has it been published to a reputable journal? Some journals are more trusted than others. Um, there are lots of journals popping up for several things that you wouldn't believe because of the quality of the evidence they generally seem to publish. Uh, if it's not trusted most of the time, it's unlikely that the rest of it's going to be trustworthy. You need to be looking at whether it has been definitely peer reviewed by other people. Generally, if it's been published, it has done, but it's again, the quality of that peer review process depends on the journal that you're looking at. Next, you need to think about what were the findings? What did they find out? What did it mean? Was it correct? Do they need to add anything else to it? Uh, what did they say? Um, do other people agree? Was it explained properly? Did they use the correct wording? Are they missing things? Is their science correct? Is there any bias in their research? Can you find out who those people are and where they come from? Is there enough data for you them to make the claims they have made? If you ever watch news stories, generally, or in a lot of the cases, they will cite news stories about, oh, this new thing's been discovered about this affecting this person. There was a small study of three or four people that were tested. Uh, if the sample groups are small, generally the data is not going to be trustworthy enough. The bigger the group that sampled is, the better that data is going to be. If they're making a conclusion, they need enough data to do so. And finally, does the rest of the research agree with what they're saying? Can you find anyone else backing up what they're saying at all? If you can't, and it's just one person saying it, and 56 other people are saying something different, it's more likely to be that the 56 people who are making the other statement are correct, uh, and if this new piece of evidence is good enough, they will change their opinions as well. If they don't, you need to think about why they haven't, because if they've not, you probably shouldn't either. This process isn't always perfect, and sometimes journals do slip through the net. One of the most famous examples of these came from this man. His name's Dr. Andrew Wakefield. I say doctor, he's not a doctor anymore. Andrew Wakefield is responsible for one of the biggest um, problems we are currently having um, worldwide. He is responsible for the statement that the MR vaccine, which is given to, ch uh, to children uh, between the age of one and three, causes autism. He published a journal uh, so quite about 20 years ago now, making that claim, um, saying that if you took that uh, vaccine, you are more likely to get autism. Uh, he put research into that uh, and it was published into a uh, journal called The Lancet. Um, now this process wasn't particularly good at peer review uh, and this means that he slipped through and after testing, once it had been published, they found several things about his research. They found out that number one, he had been paid by people to do this research. He found out, they found out that he had made up data uh, and they found out that the things he were doing, he was doing, the statements he had made was because these people had paid him to do these things. Because he made these statements, he was struck off as a doctor. He is now no longer a doctor uh, and his journal article has been thoroughly, we say, debunked. Much research has been done since then into his claim, looking at this effect, and all of the other research has found that there is no link between these two things. There is so much evidence now to say that there is no link that we generally agree that vaccines, or the MMR vaccine specifically, do not cause autism. Knowing these things will be helpful because it will allow you to properly recognise false information and ease your mind when you're reading through claims that people make because if you know they're only making the claim from three people their data is something you can completely ignore. If it's big studies from lots of people you know it's trustworthy and don't forget 
to think about all those things that I've talked about here. Thanks very much for watching. Make sure you stay safe, stay alert, stay curious and subscribe.